that they gave me in 1981, and I still play this guitar a lot. It, it's an AS200. And things happened over the years where uh, the AS200 changed a little bit. So a few years back, when they asked me to make the John Schofield signature model, I said, could we make a guitar that was more similar to the early 80s uh, AS200, and that's what, what this is. And they took my guitar, they even measured it digitally, you know, they took it out to L.A. and, and uh, uh, checked it out, said, what is it about this, this guitar that makes John like it or makes it different from the new ones? So, that's, so this has got the same kind of neck size and, and the same setup. And, uh, but I was so surprised when this guitar came out how much I liked it. Uh, for me, it, it's, it's really a comfortable guitar that can do a whole lot of things. Like all of us, you know, I've played a million amps over the years, always trying to get a better sound. And, you know, I, in a way, I've stuck with that same one guitar because I, found, I felt like the semi-acoustic style guitar really worked for me. It's in between a big, fat jazz guitar and a solid body, you know. And so I, I, I've stuck with the same guitar, but I've changed amps so much. And uh, I didn't even know that I liked Vox because uh, back in, in, you know, the earlier days, I associated it with the Beatles and George Harrison and with that sound, which was not the kind of sound I thought I had, you know, or was going for. Uh, and then on a gig, probably in, you know, somewhere in the 90s, somewhere, I was, or no, maybe it was later than that, in, in, in the early 2000s, I was playing a gig in Detroit. And they didn't have the kind of amp I wanted, which was a Mesa Boogie at that time. And uh, they had a Vox AC30, and I plugged into it, and I loved the way it sounded, and, and it just broke up right at the right place. I didn't have to use a distortion unit, you know. I started when I was young, when I was 11, and I was just playing, you know, songs that were out on the radio, just like everybody, you know. And I didn't know from jazz, really, at that point. Nobody does when they're 11, do they? And uh, and then I got into blues, and then I got into jazz music, uh, when I, but not till I was, say, 16 or 17. I started to get jazz records and take lessons from a local guitar player, you know. And, but I always played in bands as a kid, and, and uh, a lot of the same musical heroes I have now are the same ones I had then. When I first started to get into jazz, I remember buying, I, I think I had like 10 records when I was young uh, at one point, you know, and, and looking back, they were some of the greatest records ever. I had uh, Wes Montgomery live at, at, the, uh, at the Half Note, Art Farmer live also at the same club, the Half Note, it's in Jim Hall and Bill Evans' duo, Intermodulation. I ha and then I went to the record store and bought a Pat Martino record called Strings. And then I had a, a George Benson record called uh, Uptown. And I had, a, had these records and they just blew me away and I listened to them, I wore them out. And I realized in retrospect <laughs> that they were the, you know, some of the greatest jazz records ever. And I also got into Miles Davis and, and John Coltrane and Thelonious Monk and Bill Evans and Charlie Parker and had these records. And, and, and those guys are still my heroes. And there was a blues revival in the mid 60s with B.B. King and Albert King and, and uh, uh, Muddy Waters and, and Helen Wolf. And I was lucky enough to get to go see those guys, and I was way into it, you know. I remember I heard Jimi Hendrix play, and it was I thought, well, that's just the most soulful guitar playing there is, as well as being innovative and just like what he did with the instrument nobody had ever done, you know. So it made me think, well, I'll never be able to do that. I'm just going to play jazz, because if I just practice jazz, maybe I can get to it, you know? You know, I've been lucky. I mean, I've, I've been... Uh, this year, I've been on the road for 40 years, half the year, every year. You believe that? That's why I look so old, because I'm weared out, you know? <laughs> but um, I've been lucky, and, and I've gotten to play with so many great uh, musicians and that that's really the great thing especially in the jazz world of getting to play first of all with my idols you know and second of all with or as well with people that are my age or younger now 
that are really, really great. Because I think, you know, being a musician is maybe even harder than it was when I was a kid as far as the amount of gigs that are around and, and the ability to make money at it. We all know that practice makes perfect. Um, and this is really true. Of course, we're never going to get perfect. But the, the, you put in the time, you'll get the results. And there's no way to get around not putting in the time. Somebody talks about mastery. So there's a book that came out that you have to put in 10,000 hours to do anything, to be really good at anything. And I think it's really true. So then you figure out how long, is, let's see, if I practice three hours a day, that'll be like 10 years or something. You know, I forget what it is. But uh, yeah, you, you have to do that. And then something happens. The, the music, the mysteries of music just uh, become known to you. And it's almost like you don't need to study the theory as much as you need to put in the time. And, and I think, you, do, you know, we, it's a combination of study and thinking about it and, and concentration. And this is how you make it, man. So it, it, it's a combination of your own study and playing with other people. And so for me, that was always just finding like-minded people somewhere to play, to make music with. And that meant taking any kind of crappy performance situation, anything, and doing it. So I think that that's really important for everybody to do that. As far as, you know, the hustle is concerned and getting your stuff out there, I think self-promotion can be damaging to a young musician, you know, that, it, you know, although we want, and now everybody can make a CD now, and we will. You will make your own CD, you know, because now everybody can relatively inexpensively. But you know what? People give me CDs every night, and I don't listen to them. I don't have time. I'm trying to study other music. It's not going to get you in there. The way I find out about other musicians is hearing them play or having my friends who I know can play well tell me this guy is good so networking among other musicians is the way to get out there I really think that we know all of us players when we hear somebody we like and that's who we want to play with um, the other thing is is to being a team player you know with a group and being parts of groups and and it doesn't matter how awesome your chops are sometimes. It's more about what can I do to make this band sound good or this song sound good. And there are very few people that can, can be a, a, an aggressive jerk and, and make it. you got to be so good. Uh, I remember Jaco Pastorius would come up to you and say, you know what, I'm the greatest bass player in the world. And you would think, wow, what's wrong with this guy? Unfortunately, or fortunately for him, when you heard him, you had to agree, you know, but that's the only, absolutely never met anybody else like that in the world. You know, the other great musicians who I've met have been really humble. And uh, I think what you have to do is be available and, and, and be uh, a good team player, like I said before. Um, you know what, and it just gradually has built for me. You know, so so you don't even notice, you know, I mean, I used to get calls for stuff and I'd be so thrilled. I'd be there early and, you know, and shut up and try and play the part, you know. <laughs>